we have been going through the book of Revelation and um, you know we, we have not been really rushing while we have not been going into every detail we have been trying to take our time so that each point that each important point is properly examined and, and explained and I thank God for the way we have been progressing. I, I feel that um, you know, we have been we have been getting getting a, a view of the overall picture that that is helpful. And um, this evening, last week we were we were focused on on the beasts in Revelation chapter thirteen, and um, we have been we have been discussing that so many times. I won't go back over that particular information this evening, but we still have not gone through the verses of chapter thirteen. And there's some information there that we need to look at. So I'm going to go through the chapter this evening, verse by verse. I don't think we're going to come to the place where we are going to uh, be able to take a, a detailed look at the mark of the beast. So I'm still not going to be focused on that this evening. But um, we're going to go through chapter 13, step by step. And let's look at it together and see what kind of evidence we can we can come up with. All right. Um, I'm especially happy for those of us, for those who are here with us for the first or the second time. I did notice a few names this morning that um, we have not seen for a while or, and some that I never saw before. Uh, I know some people don't want to identify themselves, but I just want to let you know that we appreciate you being with us and we really hope that you will find the meetings such a blessing that you will become a part of the family and stay with us all right I'm, go I'm going to just go straight to the bible and we are going to go to the book of revelation okay we're going to start with revelation 13 from the beginning we have been through some of this before and um but we're going to take a more detailed examination this evening chapter 13. okay now we, we already we already saw that this statement i stood upon the sand of the sea in some versions of the bible we have what i consider to be a probably a better a better interpretation a, a, a more accurate understanding of what happened in the nasb for example which is one of the versions that I, I i kind of trust okay i'm very skeptical about some versions of the bible but the nasb is one of those that i think does a fairly good job um it says and the dragon stood upon the sand of the seashore and I, we already ex explained why this seems to be a better explanation because John is in heaven. He's standing in the throne room of God and he has not moved. So when it says, I stood upon the stand of the sea, it suggests that John was transported from heaven and taken to this uh, scene. And him standing on the sea of the, the seashore is kind of irrelevant. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make any point at all. But, but, the idea is that he stood upon the sand of the seashore. The dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. The verse before, the previous verse, chapter 12 and the last verse, says that the dragon, the dragon is angry with the woman and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And then the very next verse says, and he, that is the dragon, stood upon the sand of the seashore. So in making war, in making war, against the remnant, the dragon goes and stands on the seashore. And when he stands there, John sees a beast rising out of the sea. And the idea is that this beast is a dragon's, let me say the dragon's baby. It's a dragon's, it's a dragon's agent, okay? It's a, it's a dragon's general that he's going to use to make war against God's people. So he stands on the seashore, and when he stands there, whatever influence he uses, this beast comes up out of the sea. Now, we, are, we already saw that this beast is a composite. 
this beast is made up of every every empire every great nation that satan has used to make war against god's people over the ages they're all represented in this one single symbol that is why we have seven heads satan's work in this world satan's work against god has been carried out through or against god's kingdom has been carried out through seven great world powers and that is kind of clear when you when you go back to revelation chapter 12 here it says there appeared another wonder in heaven a great red dragon having seven heads seven heads satan's work in this world against the kingdom of god has been carried out through these seven heads are these seven great nations and of course it's seven heads and ten horns because in the very last moment of time during that last greatest conflict of all mark that point for a brief period of time for a short period of time it will it will not be any of the seven heads it will be ten horns instead of instead of a, a, an eighth head there's going to be ten horns so there are really eight great powers that satan uses because it tells us in Revelation 17, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one has not yet come. And the eighth, the eighth, the beast himself is the eighth. There's going to be an eighth king, an eighth king, but not an eighth and an eighth head. So, so Satan is represented as having seven heads. And then the eighth element of Satan's power will be the ten horns. And so when we look at the beast here in Revelation 13, we see that the beast has these seven heads and ten horns. This beast is, is an agent. He's Satan's baby. He is the one through whom Satan is going to, uh, Satan carries out his warfare against the people of God. And in the book of Daniel, you have this beast divided up. You have the different kingdoms represented as a beast each time from the time of Daniel forward. The, 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 um, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the great and terrible beast but in the book of revelation instead of giving us seven different beasts god gives us one beast with seven heads one symbol one composite with seven heads and ten horns so so when we look at revelation here satan calls up this beast from the sea but we see that the beast is not just satan's agent here at the end of time but he's Satan's agent in all ages because he has seven heads. Now, remember, remember something important about the, this, the, these seven heads. Th this is very clear in Revelation 17 and verse, um, verse 10. Okay, let me give you a King James Version. Sometimes I like to look at that before any other. And here's what it says. There are seven kings. All right, the seven heads. Five are fallen. That's what we always remind ourselves. The beast does not have seven heads. The beast has one head. One is. And the other is not yet come. So the beast has only one head. And it says in verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. So the ten horns do not receive power until, until the beast receives power. They receive power as kings one hour with the beast. When the beast becomes king number eight, when the beast becomes king number eight, then the ten horns will receive power along with the beast. And you know that is the last moment of time because that is the time when it says that um, these ten horns, these ten horns that you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So the, 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 the burning of the whore and the de devastation of the whore will take place by these ten horns. So we know this has not yet happened. So these ten horns have, have not yet received their power. A quick question uh, for clarity, Brother David. Yes. Um, you said that the beast is going to be king number eight and not head number eight is that correct correct all right 
Why do you say it that way? Because when you look at what it says here, um, let's go back and be specific about what the Bible says. It says, um, there are seven kings. Okay. All right. Now, let me, let me read it in the NASB. They are seven kings, meaning the seven mountains, the seven, the seven heads, the seven heads, the seven heads are seven kings. So there are seven heads. There are not eight heads. There are seven heads. And those seven heads are seven kings. Five of these kings have fallen. One king exists and the other king, number seven, has not yet come. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth. So we ask an eighth what? He's an eighth king, not an eighth head because the beast has only seven heads. So clearly he's, a, he's an eighth king because that's what it says. There are seven kings and the beast becomes king number eight, but he's not one of the heads. Um, wouldn't you say that the kings are represented, um, representing the kingdoms, that the kings are representative of the kingdoms? Absolutely. So, so then the, it would be an eighth kingdom? Yes. All right. That's, that, that's, that's just my, my point for clarity. Okay. Okay. Brother Arturo, I see your mic on. Are, do you want to say something? Is it Brother Arturo? I think Arturo is his name. Yeah, Brother Arturo, I, I'm not sure if you're trying to say something because your microphone is on. I'm sorry. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I just wondered if you were saying. Good. Yes, Brother Sean. One is. Yes. Explain that one for me, please. Okay, now, when, when it says one is, what is important? We ask ourselves the question, at what point in time are we looking at? Because during the history of the beast, there has always been one head. There was head number one, then it fell, then there was head number two, then it fell, then head number three, then it fell, and so on. Now, at the time that we are looking at in Revelation 17, five have fallen. So the one that is, is head number six. And at this point, there is still one to come, which is head number seven. And then after head number seven, which is to remain for a short while, then you have the, the reign of the ten horns along with the beast. So that one that is, we could ask the question, which one is this? And if we go back to the beginning and, beginning and start tracing, we will see that it has to be the Roman head, right? Because you have Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and then number six would be Rome. So that's the one that we, we say the one is. Does that, does that um, clarify that, Sean? Okay, yes. All right. Uh, so at the time when John got the vision, it was Rome that was in power. Yes. Yes, Brother Sean, go ahead. The other Sean, the other Sean. Um, you know, there are other, um, there are some interpretation uh, in Revelation 17 about the the eight being of the seven uh, um, persons would um, acquaint it with the seventh head and not um, the seven um, heads in general. They they say it's um, the the ten um, the eight would be of the seventh head. So it, it is uh, it's as if the seventh head is coming back then um, to life. Can you expound on that a little bit? All right. I, I suppose that there is there is a, 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 an interpretation that could give that meaning. If you look at um, the NASB here, look at verse 11 here. It gives that impression, right? But if you notice the word one, look at it. It's, it's italicized. They have italicized it. And you know what that means, right? It's not in the original language. It's something that the translators have, have added because whoever translates it, they think that that is probably what it is saying. But what it actually says is, the beast was an, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth and is of the seven, is of the seven. It doesn't say he is one of the seven. This, this one of, this one is an added word put in by the translator. So, the, the, the King James Version says it right. 
Yes, I, I think the King James Version, I go with the King James Version, where it says it is, uh, he is of the seven. And um, it, what, what, what it implies, if, if it say he's one of the seven, then, then people, of course, can say, that, okay, beast, uh, king number eight is the resurrection of head number seven. They could say this. And there's some merit to that interpretation, but um, it, it also suggests that um, king number eight, because look at what it says. Notice the prophecy. It's, 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 it specifically distinguishes between the beast and the heads. Look at it. It, it. it says the seven heads are seven mountains, right? And there are seven kings. And then where are the heads? They are on the beast. They are on the beast. So when the seven heads are ruling, what do we do? Do we eliminate the beast? No, each of those seven heads is the beast. So when it says the beast, the beast is the eighth. He is the eighth. Are we now saying that, how does the beast become the eighth king if he's not also an eighth head? What the Bible is doing is making a distinction between the seven heads and the beast, because the beast comes back not as an head. He's a king, but he's not a head, because it's clear the beast has only eight, he has only seven heads. And the Bible distinguishes the beast comes in not as head number seven or, or six or five or four. The beast comes in as king number eight, but not as a head. It's making that distinction. That's what I see very clearly. So that's why I don't agree with that interpretation. It is saying that the beast comes back as eighth king without a head. After the heads are gone, then the beast comes Brother, David. Um, just, uh, David. But, um, just a minute. Brother Matt, and then... Um, UK, somebody said you, it was from the UK and then Brother Ian. Go ahead, Brother Matt. Okay, Wayne here, David. Yes, Brother uh, Matt, then Ian. Then Ian. Well, I mean, even just from the children's study this morning, uh, the image says that Rome will be in control till the end, till Jesus comes. So the seventh head, uh, is, the sixth head is going to be the, the, the same power throughout. Is it not, not correct? I mean, Maybe there'll be other kingdoms, you know, another king and in, in, in implying another kingdom, but the power, the, the ruling power will still be Rome in some, some way. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's what Sean is saying as well. Sean is, Sean is not saying, he's saying that some people interpret it this way. And we agree, I believe, that you can't get away from the fact that if Rome is head number six, then number seven is also a form of Rome. And the beast from the bottomless pit must also involve a form of Rome. So, so in, in that sense, we are correct. From, from number six right to the end, it's Rome. But in some ways, it is such a different manifestation of Rome that God is making it into a distinct head. In some ways, it is so different. And if you think about how Rome has changed from the days of the Caesars to the days of the European Union to whatever form it's going to take in the future, the difference is very great. It's the same geographical location. It's the same kind of political philosophy, philosophy in the background, but it's, it's Rome undergoing some morphing, some changes. And I think that's why you know, it's represented in this way. Go ahead, um, Brother Ian. Yeah, I was wondering if it has anything to do with the fact that you said that the beast that was and yet is and shall be. Well, 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 of course, because no matter which of the heads you go to, it's always a beast. It's the same beast. So even though what it says is that there's a point where you can't see a head, you think the beast is gone, but the beast is still there. That the beast is going to manifest itself in its true nature, so it's not using any representation of heads anymore. Yes, which is why some people say, I mean, could the beast be Satan himself? But I don't think so. In my opinion, and we'll, we'll discuss this more when we come to Revelation 17, but in my opinion, this beast is going to be the greatest manifestation of pure Satanism that the world has ever seen, in my opinion. Brother Wayne, go ahead. Okay, well, thanks. Um, so I was thinking, 
um, why is it so important to, why is it so significant to see it um, as kings and not an, another head? Why is that so important? Um, is it that, and secondly, I was thinking, CNT is not a head, is the beast then a headless beast and now operated just by kings? That's a challenge for me there. Yeah, because I, I, my explanation would be that when you talk about a head, you are looking at a unified empire. You can, you can, you can go back and trace through time and you can see that all of the nations represented were empires. In other words, they had one head. Like Babylon, you can identify Babylon. You can identify Middle Persia, Greece, Rome. You can say that all of these were empires. There were major kingdoms that had sub-kingdoms under their dominion. But if there's no head, it means that there's no single kingdom that you can identify that is now identifiable as the manifestation of the beast. Instead of one single kingdom, what you have is an e equal manifestation of equal kingdoms that carry out the one agenda without any one of them dominating. That's how I would, would understand it. Understood, understood, thanks, understood. Okay, all right, so it says he has, um, it says he, upon, he has upon his horns 10 crowns, okay? Let me look at that in, 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 in I want to point this out because we are kind of going into a little bit more detail in the study of this chapter. David, it says, David, are we yes, talking uh, about son of perdition? Not specifically, no. The, the son of perdition may be involved as a part of this beast. But because it of, says that the end's not going to come until the son of perdition be revealed in uh, Thessalonians. Yes, uh, absolutely. The, the, the difference with the son of perdition is that we are talking about, I believe, an individual person, an individual. But the beast yeah. is clearly not an individual. It's, it's, it's a kingdom or an empire. So okay. there is a difference. You know, I think the beast is, 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 is a part of this empire that we are looking at. But the beast, the beast I mean, the, the son of perdition, the man of sin, is a part of this empire. But the empire is, is, is the, the institution, while this man is an individual person. And we'll we look at him sometime, but, but, you know, not this evening because our theme is different. Now, it says, notice it says here that the beast has on his, he has 10 crowns. Let me put it in the King James Version, understandable, 10 crowns. Now, when you go back to Revelation 12, go back to Revelation 12 on the left-hand panel here, and you'll see that the dragon has seven crowns upon his head. So here's a difference with the beast. The beast does not have seven crowns on his seven heads. He has 10 crowns upon the 10 horns. That's a difference. And you, if you say, why is there a difference? This to me, where it says that the beast has 10 crowns. I'm going to ask the question and to see if anybody can be on, is on my wavelength. Why would you think that at some point the, there are no crowns on the horns and at some point there are crowns on the horns? Anybody want to venture an answer? The horn uh, signifies power, doesn't it? Yes. Minor kingdoms. Why, why, why does God represent them as having crowns here? I think that's the because they have received power. They have now become, they have now become uh, leaders or powers. Um, they, they've become kings at this point. That's, that's what I have in mind. It, it, yeah. They are represented here. God represents them as having crowns because this helps us to identify the time that we are looking at. It's very important because, you know, people have different interpretations of the book of, of Revelation 13. Some people put most of Revelation 13 back in the historical past. But remember from what we just looked at, when do these horns receive power? After the, the same time, time. After the seventh head, I, I hear about that. Oh, I, 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 after the seventh head falls and the beast becomes king, num king number eight, then the ten horns receive power. So this helps us to identify 
what point are we looking at in Revelation 13? We are looking at where the ten horns become crowned. They receive their power. So right away, this helps us to, to, to be able to date Revelation chapter 13. Go ahead, Brother Ayayi. Well, uh, I used to have a different interpretation of that. Is that when Rome was Roman Empire, the, the ten ones didn't have power on their own. Is at the fall of the Roman Empire that the ten horns receive power, is what I understand. I appreciate that and I understand. And th these ten horns, I, I, I admit that they, 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 they caused a lot of confusion for me. And the reason, the reason is that in Daniel chapter 7, I hope I'm not confusing anybody, but in Daniel chapter 7, we see the fourth beast having 10 horns. But what is very clear in Daniel chapter 7 is that those 10 horns do not remain. They quickly become eight horns because there is a little horn that tears up three of those horns, and that little horn becomes an eight horn. So the beast actually only has eight horns for most of his existence. So when you come down to the end of time and you have you see that there are 10 horns, 10 horns, and these horns now come to power, not after number six, not after head number six, not after head number seven, but after the fall of head number seven, these horns come to power. It's clear to me that these are not the same horns that you are looking at in Daniel, because in Daniel there are only eight horns. But in, in Revelation here, there are 10 right up to the end, right up to the judgment of the great whore. An end time event, you see these 10 horns. So I believe that these 10 horns are 10 end time powers right down at the very end of time for one hour when the beast becomes king number eight, then they will receive power. So I don't think it's referring to the same 10 horns, brother IAE. Uh, doc, I mean, uh, Pastor David, I mean, uh, Brother David, Yes, but this is it's Bobby. Just, uh, I, I just been listening at the news. Sorry. I just been listening at the news and you know, uh, the French president is really upset because the um the Islam the Islamic uh community is upset because um one of their people uh Jeez. beheaded someone and stabbed someone else and so uh, the French president is saying that he's not going to have these people trying to destroy the freedom that they have. And he's really upset. And it sounds like, you know, um, and then the Muslims, they're saying that they shouldn't, they, they because this man uh, uh, put a, um, uh, he made, he made a, a cartoon of Mohammed. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why this happened. But, you know, the prince, the French president was saying that they, uh, this was their freedom of expression. And they're allowed to do that. And you can't go killing them because of that. And they're, they're not going to have these people infringing on their right for self-expression. So, you know, in, in, in his secular society, in other words, he's not looking on it as being religion. He's, he's not dealing with that he's reflecting on somebody's religious because the French society is not religious. Yeah. So I don't, you know, and I, I recall you're saying something at the end time, it was going to be a, a more a more secular type of a thing. Yes, and, and Brother David, I hear about that. I, 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 I just want to ask a question, Brother David. Okay. I want a question, Brother David. Go ahead, Brother Samuel. Uh, the problem I have, I'm looking at this, is that we're talking about the end time. Yet in Daniel, his image had the fourth beast, which is iron, and he had another beast that came up that was mixed with iron and clay. And that end until Jesus came, because the rock came and hit them on the foot, the foot. The foot. They missed those ten toes. Now, what are those ten toes? They're mixed with iron and, and clay. Where's that beast at? 
Okay, um, first of all, I'm going to eliminate the toes because Daniel 2 does not mention toes. The 10 toes are an assumption, okay? What it mentions is a feat of iron and clay. So we know that there is a mixture of iron and clay, which means the angel explains it when he says that um, there will be in it the strength of iron. But it won't cleave. There will be in it the strength of iron and the weakness of clay. But but in, even the book of Daniel, if I can go there very quickly, I'll show you something. I'll show you something um, in Daniel chapter 2. Just a moment, Daniel chapter 2. Um, look at what he says. Um, he says, look at verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. Does he say that it's the same kingdom? It's the same kingdom, but the kingdom has, has been divided. It's the same room. As the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. It's the same kingdom, but the nature changes. At one point, the kingdom is solid iron. But when you see the, 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 the toes of the, or the, the feet of iron and clay, it's not a different kingdom. It's the same kingdom, but it has changed its nature. It has morphed into something else. And so it, it, it's partly strong and partly broken, which is, which is what we see, what we have seen in Europe for, for, for many years and what we see kind of being solidified in the European Union. Okay. But what the Bible shows us, what Revelation shows us is something that is not brought out clearly in the book of Daniel because Daniel is, is like a synopsis. Revelation goes into great details. And in Revelation, it tells us that down at the end, the power of the beast is going to express through 10, 10 kingdoms that have not received any, any power as yet. Rome is going to be manifested in 10 faces, if I put it that way. There are 10 elements in that part of the world that are going to come together to form some kind of, of, of power at the last moments of time that will destroy Catholicism and, and the false churches. But exactly what that is, is something we still need to, 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 to wait to see what, uh, what form it's going to take. Where's the little horn at, Brother Davis? Where's the little horn doing this? And the, and the little horn that came up and was blaspheming God. That's in Daniel chapter it? seven, okay? And then I always thought the clay also talk about religion I know it says weak, but I always thought Myra Clay was speaking about uh, well, about religion. That's because God had the Myra Clay when he was he would, the clay was he took the clay and made and made another uh, bowl or whatever. But I always yeah. thought Myra Clay when he read, read that he was talking about religion. Is I'm wrong? Well, I'm wrong there. Well, look at what the let's look at what the Bible says about it. Let's look at, at what okay. the Bible. Says. All yeah. right, and there was ten toes there too, but that's another way. Right, it, it's I, 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 every person has ten toes, but it doesn't. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. I was saying. Yeah. It. <laughs> right, right. But if, if, if the Bible doesn't mention it, it's not wise to bring it in because the, the image also had ten fingers. Oh. But the Bible did say ten toes, though, brother David. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. It says so ten toes. You could read it again if you want to. Can you remind me? It's did ten I, toes. Did I read it? Did yes, you say that? You, you know, yeah, Okay. I am sorry. I completely forgot that if I, I completely overlooked that. In feet toes. It didn't no. say ten toes. It, it didn't say, say ten toes. toes. In verse 42, the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay. So I mean feet have ten toes. Right. But I mean it, it also has ten. An, an image also has ten fingers. So what do those mean? It's in you mind if I have them? What I mean is we can't add an interpreter. You can't say the ten fingers mean something because every everybody has ten fingers. You know, the, 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 the number of the toes, God does not mention even the number. So uh, it, 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 to say that because we, we, we know that a feet has ten toes, then it must have been ten toes, is an assumption. And, and to, to, to bring an assumption into the, if we're going to interpret it, it's kind of a little, it's a shaky ground on which to stand. That's what I'm saying. 
but um, he teaches that. I, 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 I'm aware, I, I think so, Brother Raymond. I think that's where it comes from. But if you look at this, Brother, um, Brother Samuel, see how God explains the iron and the clay. And I don't think, I don't think we should, we should, we, we can suppose that it might mean something else, but this is what God says, okay? He says, there shall be in it of the strength of iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with my clay. And then he goes on to say, as the, as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So, so God explains the meaning of the iron and clay, and he says, the iron represents strength and the clay represents weakness. So, so some people interpret that to say that it means that the clay, they, they say the clay represents religion. But God tells you that the clay represents the weakness of the kingdom. What is the next verse, read? Brother David? What read the next verse for me? And whereas thou sawest iron mingle mixed with my clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So what does he mean by this? I mean, I'm satisfied with the explanation I I I I read when I first began to study the prophecy that um the nations of Europe have perennially tried to unite by different means. And one of the means they tried to use was to intermarry the heads of state. As a matter of fact, in Jamaica, they have a, they have a, a phrase that we use. If somebody gets married to a close relative, they refer to it as royalty. I don't know if that's everywhere or only in Jamaica, but they refer to it as royalty because of this practice that the royalty in Europe have. They marry their relatives. They marry one another, and it was an attempt to, to, to unite the nations of Europe by intermarriage. This man would give his daughter to, to marry to the, the son of that other king, and they would marry each other, hoping to unite by means of intermarriage. So they mingled themselves with the seed of men, but God said they would not cleave together because God's, the prophecy says that after Rome, there would not be another kingdom. However, the prophecy also says that there would be some kind of unity because they would mingle themselves, but they wouldn't have any, any, any strong cohesiveness. That's what God says. But it's the same kingdom because it's the same iron kingdom now weakened. There are elements in it that, that, that keep it from, from being bound together. But anyway, let's go back to Revelation. Revelation 13. Now it says that upon his heads, upon the heads of this beast, there is a name of blasphemy. Now, I want us to, 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 to put this as a nail in a sure place because later on, we're going to come upon the phrase, the name of the beast. For, for a long time, I was, I was battering my brain. What is, the head of, what is the name of this beast? And here it is right before our, 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 our eyes. It says, upon the head of the beast is the name of blasphemy. So if we want to know the name of the beast, we simply have to understand what does the Bible mean when it uses the word blasphemy? And we're going to come to that a little later, okay? Now, the verse two, verse two says that, gives us a connection with Daniel seven. He had the feet of a, 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 a leopard. The beast is like a leopard, reminiscent of Greece in Daniel seven. His feet as the feet of a bear, reminiscent of the Medo-Persian kingdom in Daniel seven. His mouth as the mouth of a lion, representative re reminiscence of the Babylonian kingdom in Daniel 7. So we see that this beast, further evidence that this beast is a composite. He's a, he's a put together of all the nations, of all these kingdoms, the empires that Satan has used in one symbol. The dragon gave him his power. So Satan, this word power here is from the Greek word exousia. It doesn't mean he has the power to... To, to call lightning from the sky or to move mountains or to call up a storm. It means he has, he has um, delegated power, delegated authority. Okay? So the dragon gave him his, his authority, his seat. He gave him great authority. So whoever this beast is, he's not just a figurehead. He has authority. When he speaks, things happen. Um... Let me just mute everybody because there's somebody whose mic is making noise. Now it says the dragon, I saw one of his, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. 
And um, there's some there's an assumption here. I'm going to look at another translation and see how it puts this verse because there's something I want to point out. If I go to the NASB, look at how it reads in the NASB. All right. In the King James Version, it says, I saw one of his heads as it as it were wounded to death. The King James Version gives us the impression that John saw the beast receiving this wound. John saw somebody stabbing the beast or cutting off his head or something. But if you look at the other translations, it does not contradict the King James, but it gives a little additional meaning that shows you something. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. In other words, when John looks at the beast, the wound is already there. When John sees the beast for the first time, the wound is already there. We are not looking at the beast at a point where he's receiving this wound. When John sees the beast, he has already been wounded. And what is remarkable is that John now sees the, the wound being healed. Why am I making this point? Because again, it helps us to, to understand the timing that John is looking at. This is not a beast in history. At this point of the beast existence, it's not in the distant past of the dark ages, the middle ages, the time of the reformation. It's, it's an end time. It's the end of time that John is seeing this beast. The dragon has said he's going to make war against the remnant of the seed and the beast is his agent. And that's what we are looking at in chapter 13 here. It's the end time work of the beast that we are looking at. So we are looking at the beast where head number six is, is in power. And, and the, 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 the wound is there, but we are looking now at a time when the wound is being healed. And it says his deadly wound was healed. His deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Is it like a this, scar? Well, it could be like a scar, yeah. Or maybe, I don't know how John saw it, but anyway, it was evident to him that this was a wound and that it, it seemed like it was a death wound. When he sees the beast, it's like, it's like you see something and you're amazed at how horrific it looks and then it's healed before your eyes. And look, no, notice they, the word, Sister Janet. Uh, at this point, is this the eighth beast? When it's healed, does that make it the eighth beast? Does it morph into the eighth beast? You understand what I'm asking? Yes, I understand what you're asking, and I, 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 I am tempted to believe that you are right. But I have, I have some questions that I won't say straight up that you are right. But it's, it's, it's right about at that time. Okay. Did you, does he mean I, eight head or eight beast? Eight, eight, eight king. Eight king. Okay. Eight, eight king. king. I think that's what she, she means, right? Notice right. the word. Notice the word wondered. Notice how it's spelled. Okay. You have two words that sound similar, and sometimes people mix them up. The other word is W A N, which means that they 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 walk along behind the beast. They wandered after the beast means that they are following along behind the beast. But to, this is wonder, which means that the world is amazed. They are filled with amazement. And they are watching the progress of the beast and they are amazed at what they see happening with the beast. All right. Um, in, in the, in the, Brother in the, David, is, is religion coming in here because it says the, the dragon was worshipped? I'm coming to that, Brother, brother okay. Samuel. It's the next verse, right? Right. I just wondered myself about that. Yes. Um, in the NASB, it, it gives the idea of following the beast. But uh, notice again, in the NASB, it's an added phrase. I don't know why they add this phrase. It says, and the whole world was amazed and followed after the beast. Okay, but the word and followed after is more an interpretation. The verse really says the whole world was amazed at the beast. They wandered after the beast. And of course, if you are amazed at something and you wonder at it and you admire it, then you are going to follow it. So I suppose that is that is that is a natural progression, because we go to the next verse, which is what um, Brother Samuel mentioned. It says, "And they worshipped the dragon." Now the dragon is Satan, and I'm pretty sure that the world will not be openly worshiping Satan. The only people on earth that I know who worship Satan is the First Church of Satan there in California and wherever else they have spread to, and maybe some witches and warlocks and so on, but most of the world thinks negatively of Satan. So when it says they worship the dragon, 
it introduces an idea here that we need to understand. Again, Revelation is using biblical expressions from the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, they mean one thing, but when we translate them over into the New Testament, we have to understand the spiritual implication. To worship in the New Testament implies offering loyalty and submissiveness to something. When Jesus spoke to the Jews, and 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 he they they said, We be Abraham's seed. Jesus said, You are of your father the devil. Now, he, why were they the children of the devil? You know, they said we are, they were actually uh, genetically the seed of Abraham. And according to their worship ritual, they would have said they were worshiping Jehovah. But Jesus says, your father is the devil. He was actually saying, you're worshiping Satan. You give your loyalty and you submit to Satan. You are of, of, of the devil. Because worship is more than just where you go to church and what time of the day you offer your prayers or how often you read the Bible. Worship is a matter of the heart and the life. And if you submit to something satanic, you actually worship Satan. This is what Jesus is saying. That's a New Testament, that's a revelation concept of worship. So they worship Satan while they call upon the name of God, no doubt. Would you even go as far to say as uh, worship would even con be considered acknowledgement to some degree? Uh, not even anything close to reverence or adoration, but just even uh, acknowledging his power. I agree, Brother Matt, and I think I think the rest of the verse implies this. When we come down a little further, you're going to see where what you said is implied in the rest of the verse. But notice how they worship the dragon. They worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. If you go to the NASB on the right-hand panel, they worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. In other words, they're not worshiping Satan. They don't even think of Satan, but they are, they are, they are submitting to the beast. And in submitting to the beast, they are not submitting to the beast. They are submitting to the, 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 the philosophies and the principles of the one who gave this to the beast. This is why, you know, the question of worship is so important. Uh, let, me, let me just talk uh, for a moment about denominationalism. You have people who are blindly loyal to their denomination. Okay, I don't want to talk about money, but let me talk about money. I've heard Adventists say, okay, it was one of the things that bothered me when I was a part of the system, and even when I'm not a part of the system. I I've heard people who are so blind, who are so brainwashed that they say, I don't care what the church is doing with my money. God says I'm to give it to the church, and I'm giving it. And they, they blindly put their money in the box, and they disagree wholeheartedly with many things that the church is using the money for, but they say, I'm doing my duty, okay? They, they, have, they have bought into the philosophy that the church has deceived them with. They, they have abdicated their responsibility to God and they have handed that to somebody else and they are following blindly the philosophy of a system and that system might be based on a philosophy of Satan and so they are actually submitting to Satan in the name of God. Now, I might be overdoing it. Maybe, maybe, maybe I've chosen a bad example, but I think you will get the point that I'm trying to make. When you submit yeah, to serious. something, that's very serious, there, Brad David. When, when you submit to something, just because somebody says you should do it and you feel a loyalty to that person, and you don't understand the principle behind what you are doing, you can actually be worshiping Satan by adopting his principles when all you think you are doing is submitting to something else. Now, this is how. People worship Satan. Look at the verse. David. Is... David, sorry to interrupt you, but remember Christ said to the woman at the well, he worship you, know not what? Yes. So yes. there you go. People worship, people genuinely think that they're worshiping correctly, but not, but not, but not aware of what they're really worshiping. So I, I totally agree. Yeah. So, so, so with the Bible, and particularly with the book of Revelation, it's about the underlying principles. It's about whose principles govern your life. That's what it's about. That's, that, that's what determines who you worship. Now, notice why... Brother, worship... David, 
Brother David, uh, yes, should you understand who you worship? Because just three months ago, I was worshiping the Trinity. So that basically, I was worshiping the devil, but I didn't know. I thought I was worshiping God. <laughs> but I was really worshiping, worshiping the devil. Um, I really was, right? I, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not going to go that far because, because I think that in your heart, your yeah, heart was heart, towards yeah. God. Okay? Right. I was, yeah. your heart that's was the same thing with giving money to the church though. Would it be, you giving the money you figured to God's plan. They want to take the money and spread the gospel around the world. And out. so you figures you should give it. You're not giving to them. You're giving it to God. You, it, it, you it, think it, you should question that? You should. You should always question it, I guess, huh? It's similar. We, we, here, here's, here is where I'm going to, to, to make a little distinction, okay? People have faulty concepts of God, and they have faulty concepts about some things, you know, but or they have faulty concepts about different, different elements of their religion. But what is most important, I think, when you look at this, is, is, a, is, a principles, is the principles that you accept. There are people, there are people who their concept of God and their concept of religion makes them hard hearted. It makes them cold and, and it makes them think of God as a merciless being. To me, those principles are, are, are the most vital principles of all, because this is the way you end up worshiping Satan because you have his spirit. You remember when, when Peter and when James and John said, Lord, let us call down fire from heaven on these people. And you remember what Jesus said? You yeah. think you are worshiping God. That's what they thought. And yeah. Jesus says, you don't know what kind of spirit you have. Whose spirit was it that wanted to destroy people because they would not allow Jesus to pass through? That's the devil. It was the spirit of the, of the devil. They, they had adopted Satan's principles. And if these philosophies had been allowed to develop in their minds, they would have ended up loyal to Satan instead of God. But of course, they were in Jesus' hand, and he, 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 they, eventually that was out of them. But at that moment, they certainly were not following in the ways of God. Now, notice why they worship the beast. Notice. This is related to the, 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 the point that Brother Samuel made a little earlier on. Notice what they say. And remember, when you look at Revelation, you are not getting the exact quotation of what people are saying. These words are intended to help you to see underlying principles. Remember that. They worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, I'm going to ask a question. Look at these two sentences and tell me then, why do people worship the beast? One person. He's powerful. They're so amazed. They're so amazed. His power. His power. Money. Money, I'm waiting for one, one other word. They see none greater than him. Because their names were never written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. But Brother Hell, Frederick, it's, a little, it's, a little, it's a little closer to where I'm going, but it's not quite there. But this piece is very strong because nobody can make war against it. Absolutely. But here's the. Here. here. What's that, Nikki? I was saying cells because they don't want to die. Okay, all right. What I see, let me tell you what I see. It's like you're fighting a war and you realize you can't beat this person. Fighting is useless. Fighting is useless. And so you just submit. That's what I see here. This statement, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This question says that the people of the world decide this does, you cannot oppose this and you cannot resist it. Let's just go with it. That's why they worship the beast. It's not because they are convinced in their mind. Many of them are not convinced that the beast is good or that his way is best. It's just a question of what's the point of fighting this? You cannot win. That's why they worship the beast. That's what the is. Yes, Brother that, that is solely because of who they do not serve. They do not, they do not believe in the true God of heaven. The true God of heaven or his powerful ways or his dominance over the beast 
So they true. have no hope in nothing else but themselves, and that's why they said, "Who could, who could fight the beast?" Because they believe in nothing, nothing stronger. This is true. Th th those of you who um who have an idea of where we lean in our interpretation of the mark of the beast. Let me say where we lean, because nothing is set in stone. But those of you who have an understanding, this means th this made a, this hit me with an impact when I when I understood what it is saying because the majority of the people in the world do you think they are persuaded about this this some of the things that are being pushed on the world right now okay some of the things that are being imposed on the world and people are just going with it you think they are in agreement but you know what they say we cannot beat this we cannot fight it so even on a moral issue even on issues of morality, they submit and they bend and they change their they change their their concept of right and wrong because you cannot fight this thing, you cannot beat it, you cannot make war with it. So they submit and they end up worshiping the beast and thereby worshiping Satan because they have no backbone. And as Cliff said, of course it's because they don't trust in God's power. Of course they don't, right? But then that's always the bottom line. It's lack of faith in God. But what is appalling is that the, the majority of the world does not have this faith. And even more appalling, that the majority of Christians do not have this faith. The implications are very, 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 very striking, Brother David, especially as we look at what is going on right now with the mask and what is coming with the vaccinations. But um, I'm not going to pull you off track. But I mean, what you said is very, very um <clears throat> significant as to what is coming in relation to not being able to fight the system. I, 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 right, I, I, was, I was hoping that, that we all would see the implications. Um, brother David. Brother Chris and then brother Ian. But just let, let me finish the point. Let me finish. The, the, the implications are striking because I never really saw this before in this issue. But what the Bible is saying, I see very clearly is that God is saying that they end up worshiping the beast because they think it is pointless to resist. Not because they believe, not because they believe in what the beast is saying, but because they think it doesn't make sense to fight. That's very, very striking, especially as Brother Howard said, when we look at what is happening now. Brother Chris and then Brother Ian. Yes, is it as a result of, you know, um, a part of the scripture that said he left them to their reprobate mind? You know, it's like people moving away from God. So it's like they can't see things are, you know, they don't have that, they don't have that um, ability with God's ability in them. They don't, they don't know. They, they can't choose the right way. So it's like you just left them and then just choose to go the, you know, as you say, they cannot fight the beast. So what happened? Let us just join in. That, that, that is absolutely a given. You know, they, 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 they have no spiritual insight. But then the thing is, again, brother, brother, it, Chris, it comes down to the fact that they have no faith in God. They don't have a relationship with God. Without a relationship with God, how can you have spiritual insight? Without faith, how can you stand? How can you do anything at all if you don't have faith? Everything is based upon that living relationship with God. None of us can resist the beast. None of us can fight the system. The only person who can do it is Jesus Christ. And therefore, he has to live in us. And those are the Amen. only people who can possibly stand. So, so but Brother David, some of them don't even believe God exists to begin exactly. with. And, 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 and that's going to be the pre predominating position in this final crisis. So, of course, yeah, some of these things go without saying, you know. Brother Ian. Um, Sister Diane Han has been up for a while. Let's see. Sorry, Sister Diane. You have to unmute because I can see the green easier than I can see your hand. That's okay. Um, I was thinking that the question is asked, who can do this and who's likened this because they have fought. You know, it's like people are going to fight against it. They're not going to just believe it. They're not going to just want to do it. Some people will fight against it. And as a result of fighting and they get nowhere, they march. And, and this made me think about what's going on now. There are people who are resisting this. They're marching, they're fighting, they're right. But guess what? 
The more they do that, the more the system will come down harder. And the more they try, the harder the system will push against them. And then guess what? Then they get weary and then they like, we can't do it. We've tried, we've done everything. This is self-preservation, however. Of course they don't believe in God, but they do resist it. And then when they can't anymore and they're worn out, then they just collapse and say, well, who can do this? We've done everything we can. Who can resist this piece? It's more powerful than us. Yes, there's a Jamaican, um, there's a Jamaican singer, singer, yeah, singer. His name, they call him Beanie Man, but he's a popular dance hall artist. I mean, internationally has been traveling to different countries, but um, many years ago, about 20 years ago, he did some songs attacking the gay movement. And, um, you know, he, he, he claims to be a Rastafarian and the Rastafarians are these rebels. They don't bend for anything. It, they are proud of the fact that they don't bend and they don't bow. And they, they call everything Babylon. And, you know, he, 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 he was touting his agenda against gays. You know what they did? He was to sing in, in the park in New York. They, they picketed the organizations. They withdrew the invitation. He was to go somewhere else. They withdrew the invitation. Eventually, he, he, I think the, the video is still on YouTube. He came on YouTube and he apologized to the gay community. He said he made, he made a little video when he was young and inexperienced and he's sorry he doesn't have anything against anybody. He apologized. They started inviting him out again. He was on television in Jamaica. They interviewed him on some entertainment program. And they said, Beanie Man, what are you going to say to the, the, the claim that you bowed? You bowed. He said that I bowed. Look here. All I want to say is I want them to try it. I want somebody else to, to do differently than me. Because I, I have to work and I couldn't get any work. You know. And you know what happened? He came on another time, some some so a couple of years later, and he says, They are still fighting him. He said, I I I I apologize. I came on and I apologized and I did everything I should. It looks like the only thing will make them happy is if I become a homosexual myself. You know, Brad David, he actually said that to Vlad. Vlad and him were on the same flight coming from Germany, and Vlad went to him and spoke to him about it, and he told Vlad that directly. Yes. Uh, okay, right. So anyway, what I'm saying is, this, this guy is like a, an example of, of what this verse is saying. Who is able to make war with him? The, these people, you, you can rebel all you want. You can rebel all you want. You can say, I will not bow, and I'm going to stand up. Look here. When the knife is to your throat, let's see what you are going to do. Either you have Christ or you don't have Christ. The weakest among us will stand. Sister Sharon was talking this morning. She said she was on the way coming home from the hospital. Every night she's afraid. Let me tell you. Sister Sharon will stand up to the beast with Christ in her. And the big strong ones like Howard and, well, I wouldn't put myself in the, in the condition of the big strong ones, but the big strong one like Brother Howard and whoever else. Without Christ, you're going to bend like a little reed. You're going to break like a little piece of stick. And the weaker ones who know nothing and have no strength, all you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. And with all the alarm in the book of Revelation about the beast and the mark of the beast, that is really the bottom line. Jesus is, it, it, it's, it's a call to solidify our position in Christ because nothing else is going to help us to stand in what is coming. So I'd like to make a point, but I think Ian is before me. So no, go ahead. I, I defer. Okay. Um I, I'm just saying, Brother David, what is amazing is is how how we have been taught, just that we, we never ever looked through the passage, we never ever saw anything. And so they told us, they taught us and told us that that the worship of the beast has to do with Roman Catholicism and the Roman Catholic Church and we're um, um, worshiping the church because whatever the church dictates to us we follow and um, the worship is just used here in Revelation to mean worship. Miracles is used to mean um, something that happens that, that's why we're to told um, about uh, apostate Protestantism and all of these things and the, I mean we never had you never had to go through all of that you were just looking at what the word of god says looking at what the meanings of the word are from from old testament um using the same language of the old testament what they mean and you're seeing a totally different um thing altogether that is amazing that is amazing 
yeah, the, 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 I believe the greatest hindrance to truth is knowing. The greatest hindrance to learning truth is knowing. Um, I, I've heard some some interesting quips. You know, um, I, I, I tried to teach him something, but he knew too much. Things like that, and that was that. That is where I, I have been, and where a lot of us have been. We know too much for God to say anything to us because we have all the answers. We learned too much. That's the blockage to truth. And I, I've heard people say, and I say myself, that the greatest moment in my life was when I, when I was put out of the Adventist church. But I would say it wasn't even at that point in time. It was when I came to the understanding that the church does not know everything. That's when I started to go to the Bible with an open mind and just to listen to the Bible. And I know that we probably still have some things wrong, of course, but I think we're much closer to where we ought to be than when I was simply listening to what other people said. So, praise the Lord. Well, Brother David, you know, I wanted to ask um, something as to that. Do you think you have um, religious leaders out there who deliberately know, they know that what they're preaching is wrong but for some reason it's like they don't care and how is that possible how is that possible well i'm going to tell you what my father said my father was a seventh day adventist minister and um he had he and another friend of his a fellow minister he, he told me that one time you know they were i don't remember what it was he said that they were studying from the bible and they they went to the the, the head of the union a minister by the name of elder nation and um, they, they tried to sh they started to share with him what they were seeing. They were quite excited and they felt that, you know, it would make a difference because it was something um, different than the church was teaching on this particular subject. And Elder, Elder Nation listened to them. And then he said, gentlemen, you're paid to teach Adventist doctrine. Any day you can't teach that doctrine, stop drawing your paycheck. That was his My answer. Word. That was his answer. That was the end of the story. And um, you, 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 you and I might find it difficult to understand, uh, Brother Chris, because we are not being paid to teach anything. Our motives are, are honest because we don't care. We have nothing to lose. But when people are being paid to teach the world, to teach something, and to maintain a system, it's not about truth. It's about maintaining the system and that's a mindset that might be hard for us to grasp but it's 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 real and it's out there brother how would I, I mean brother david i just wanted to say to the brother the bible says that some are hirelings and you've got to understand that all the shepherds some are hirelings and as a result of being a hireling they do what they're hired to do and so they don't really care about the sheep it's what they care about the dollar and then you've got to understand i think with denominations it's a it's a business uh it operates like a business it it hires and fire it acts and operates like a business and not like the body of christ exactly exactly you remember very you remember when we, we just got into the um the understanding of the of, of the godhead and that the trinity was false um we had shared it with a friend that that went um to the to the ministry the ministry and shared it with some conference um um pastors and in the meeting, they said, hey, this thing is amazing, but you, you can't share this with the lady. This has to be kept among us, the intellectuals. That's what the guy told us that they said in the meeting. They said, look here, this is amazing, but you can't share this with the lady. It has to be kept among us, the, in, the intellectuals. So that's an amazing thing, you know. Can I ask you, uh, are you going to go into verse 5? Because yes. I have a question. Yeah, but go ahead with the question. Well, it's, it's implying that um, he was given power for 42 months. So are we talking about future or are we talking about what had passed the 1260 years of papal supremacy? All right. You, you, you have asked the hardest question. And it is the hardest question because I, I don't have a clear answer. I don't have a clear answer to the time period. And this is a hard thing for me in the book of Revelation. I'm going to, I'm going to confess it clearly. You're my brothers and sisters, and I, I'm, not ashamed, I'm not afraid to tell you where I am. 
this week I was asking the Lord to help me to sort through these time periods. I went back to Daniel and I'm, I'm in Revelation here and I still don't have a clear answer, but I will. I will by God's grace, okay? But I don't because it's clear to me that this time period in some places, it refers to the historical 1260 years. It's clear to me, at least in one place. But in Revelation 12, for example, which says that the woman is given two wings of a great eagle, where she flies into the wilderness for a time, times, and, and, and half a time, it's clear to me that this is a, a historical 1260 years because it is after this that the dragon goes to make war on the remnant. But here we see the dragon making war on the remnant here now, and he calls up the beast, and now the beast is given power to continue 42 months. Remember, the, the woman in the wilderness was previous to this time. So I am of the conviction that this 42 months is referring to the future time of trouble when the beast comes up again with, with, with his power. But how do I prove it? How do I prove it? I can't give you a clear answer to that question. I'm telling you frankly and freely. I'm convinced it's a future time, but I don't have a clear answer. But I, I will promise all of you who are listening that I won't stop asking the Lord and searching until I have a proper answer. Okay, Brother Mark? Right. That's fair. It's possible that it could be chiastic as well. It may not be because maybe we've reached the center of the of the book and now it's just duplicating itself going back down. Several possibilities. Yes. If I may say um, quickly, Brother David, that um, the the that 42 month um that that is me i i don't know if you you have seen this you know you have some um independent ministries in adventism now um i think um amazing word um serve this um prophecy tv um prophesy, prophesy again tv and a few of them anyway last week i was amazed that one one of the guys were um having a big issue and he was calling out for a big um uh, um, they were side, sh they were cold shouldering um, this this Chinese looking fellow. I don't remember his name. Anyway, he came out to say they have all done this because he believes that there's a future three and three and a half years um, in Revelation. And he said all of these other guys um, in Adventism are are um, calling him a false prophet and saying all of this against him because of that and he said why don't we come together as brothers and sisters as, as brothers in Christ and discuss this openly in the spirit of humility and so on. So that that is something amazing. But according to to, to the question Matt asked, I'm thinking um, clearly that this this 42 months pro, pro, um, proceeds to the the war against the saints and overcoming the saints. So I believe this is still future. This has never happened before, where the beast will actually overcome the saints. So that is that is clearly mentioned in chapter 11 when it says that the beast from the bottomless pit, pit kills the two weakness. It said here that. The beast will make war um, um, against the saints and overcome them. And in Daniel chapter 12, it says, until he has, he has um, accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So when you look at, at this in an overall view, it seems to suggest it's future of our time. Or maybe thinking, our time here. I was thinking that in chapter 11, it speaks about the body, the bodies of the two witnesses lying in the street for a period of time too. Isn't that three and a half days? Yes, but that three and a half days is after the 1260. Remember, yeah, remember right. that they, they prophesied for 1260 days in sackcloth, then they are killed, then their bodies lie for three and a half days. Okay, so the, it would, I mean, the 1260 would, could be calculated back to 42 months, couldn't it? Yes, but, but as I say, three there, and are, half days. Yeah. there are several places where these times come up, and I don't think. I don't want us to go into it at this time because we're not going to have any answers discussing it like this. We have to look at, we have to get get get, get a, a book and write down every place and go and compare them and maybe we'll come up with something. But there are several places, all right? But um, to, in answer, the, the, the quick answer is that I am persuaded that this is a, is a future time period, Brother Matt. That's a quick answer, okay? Now, and 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 just to just to tell you why I'm strongly persuaded, Revelation I believe is not a a, a a hodgepodge of different periods just thrown together. It's a storyline, and the story is developing and unfolding. And in chapter twelve, you had 
The dragon goes to make war against the woman. The woman flees into the wilderness for 1260 days. He can't catch the woman. He goes after the seed and he goes to make war against the seed. And he calls up the beast and the beast comes up and he gives the beast his power. And he tells the beast, you are going to continue for 42 months. It's a continual story. He doesn't take us back into when the woman is in the wilderness. So this 42 months, I believe, is, is future, right? Power is given unto him to continue 42 months. Now it says there is given unto this beast a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on this blasphemies a little bit more, especially in Revelation 17. But just to comment here. Um, in Adventism, not to, not to knock Adventism continually, but, but it's just that that is my background. It's what I know. It's what I can refer to. In Adventism, they say the Pope blasphemes because he claims to be God on earth and because he claims to have the power to forgive sins. And so th this is pointed out as one evidence that we're speaking about the Catholic Church and the papacy in particular. But remember, the imagery from Revelation is from the Old Testament, most of it. It's from the Old Testament you find most of these things, Babylon, Egypt, Armageddon, Israel, the tribes of Israel, the slain lamb, everything, the, the imagery is from the sanctuary, everything is from the Old Covenant. And so it's in the Old Testament we should go to find what does blasphemy imply. And um, it's only used in one incident, two places, one incident in the, book, in, in the Old Testament. And it's when the Assyrian king came to attack Israel. And he threatened the people on the wall and he told them what his king was going to do to them. And he told them, listen, don't let Hezekiah fool you and think that God can help you. Don't let him think that your God can deliver you because none of the gods of the nations that we have, we have destroyed, none of those gods can help them. So don't you think that Jehovah can deliver you? And Hezekiah, they, they, they brought the message to King Hezekiah. And it says, Hezekiah sent to Isaiah the prophet, sent to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amon. And they said to him, thus says Hezekiah. Let me go to the King James Version. Right. Thus said Hezekiah. This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. It's a day of blasphemy. And notice what they refer to as blasphemy. It is when a heathen came up and he said, Who is God? Your God can't help you. He, he defied the authority and the power. Let me see where he says it. Where are the gods of Hamath or of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hina, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who, am, who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand? That the Lord, our Jehovah, should j deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. That is the blasphemy of, of the Assyrian king when he came against Jerusalem. He said, the Lord can't deliver Jerusalem. None of the other gods could deliver them. Nobody can stand against me. That is what the Old Testament defines as blasphemy. It's when you defy God and you defy God's authority and God's power and you make God of nothing. This is the spirit that is prevailing in the world today among the governments of the world. It says, and power was given unto him to continue for 40 and two months. In other words, what we see here is that this final battle against God's people will continue for 42 months. The two witnesses prophesied 1260 days. Now, let me, let me talk about this 42 months period. It, it's, it's three and a half years. And three and a half years has a lot of significance in several outstanding moments in the Bible. For example, when God chastised Israel, when they had turned to the, to, to the worship of Baal, God sent 
a famine in the land for three and a half years. There were, it was three and a half years that Elijah shut up heaven and no rain fell. And, and this, this, this period represents a time when God intervenes and God's people are standing against apostasy, but they are under great pressure. Remember that Elijah felt that he was the only, this was a great moment in Elijah's life. This was the time when Elijah thought that he was the only person alive who was still serving God because everybody, even those who claimed to be God's people were against him. So we come to a similar time in history. And again, you have another three and a half year period. Also remember that the time that Jesus ministered on this earth, the time that Jesus revealed God on this planet, was three and a half years. So this three and a half year period is very, it's very, has, has great significance. And um, it seems to me that this, it, it's not unusual that this time period should be a time chosen by God when again he will manifest his glory through his people. A similar situation. It says of this beast in verse six, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Um, do you know of any place and any time where anybody has ever done this? They say that the Pope, they say that the Pope claims to be able to forgive sins. How does this apply to blaspheming God's tabernacle? How does this apply to blaspheming those that dwell in heaven? I was looking at it and wondering, how would you interpret this? But I'm going, to, I'm going to make a wild suggestion, okay? Because I believe everything that is here is intended to mean something, but I'm going to make a wild suggestion <laughs> um, because I don't have anything better to, to suggest, okay? Is it possible that when it says his tabernacle, it is referring to his church? Is it possible when it says them that dwell in heaven, it's not referring to angels? but to God's people who worship in heavenly places. I'm just going to throw that out there because it's, I, I can understand how the beast will blaspheme God's people, blaspheme his true church, and also attack, blaspheme against those who worship God. But I can't really figure out why, if it was referring to literal heavenly things, them that dwell in heaven would refer to, he to angels. And his tabernacle would refer to heaven itself. And while I see the, 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 the powers of earth blaspheming God and blaspheming his name, disrespecting him, but how would it apply to the actual place? And that is why I'm tempted to apply this to the tabernacle being his church and them that dwell in heaven, referring to God's people. All right? That's just yeah, about brother it. David. Yes, brother, I brother. Yeah, I think this makes sense because we were talking about the beast who was uh, exercising yielding a power on the on the earth and the water. So when we are talking about those who dwell on the earth shall worship him, which means those who don't know Christ Jesus. Very good point, Brother Ali. Very good point. Very good point. Very good. Point. Yeah. So it makes sense to me that those who dwell in heaven, because Paul said that we have been um, translated into heavenly places. Heavenly places. Thank you. I appreciate that input because that's a very good point. That that, that um. Yeah, especially in contrast, it says that those who dwell on earth will worship him. So, of course, where do we dwell? It can't be on earth or else we will worship him. We worship the beast. So it has to be that we dwell somewhere else. So, yeah, I, I, I like that. So it says it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Uh, David. I didn't well, get Brother Ayai's point in terms of the blasphemy thing. No, um, he, he wasn't focusing on the blasphemy. He was focusing on where they dwell. 
Oh. Because look at what it says in verse 8. All that dwell on earth shall worship him. That is the beast. So the question is, will you worship the beast? Hopefully, no. That means you won't dwell on earth. So where will you dwell? You will dwell in heaven. That's what so when in verse 6, when it says, blaspheme his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven, um, it kind of missed me the thing that you were saying about the Old Testament's definition of blasphemy in terms of Elijah and what the people were doing. Okay, yeah, I maybe said too much. Okay, blasphemy, according to the Old Testament, is when you set out to defy God's authority and to belittle his power. That's what it, that's what it implies in the Old Testament, right? You defy his authority. And you belittle his power. You claim that God cannot do anything to prevent you from doing what you're doing. So you not only assault God in this way, you not only make these statements against God, but you make those statements against God's church and against God's people. Okay. Okay. You you belittle the power and the authority of God's people and of God's Wait, church and of God Himself. Okay. All right. So it was given unto him, it must be given unto him by God. God allows it to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And um, brothers and sisters, I'm going to say something to you, okay? I don't want to die a martyr's death. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to be hunted. I, 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 like, I like where I am. I like to be comfortable. I like to get up in the morning under my own roof. But I want you to look at what it says in verse 10, okay? And, and, and there, there is a reason why God says this to, to us. Verse 10. In the King James Version, it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. In the New American Standard Bible and in almost every other version, Listen to what it says. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone is, if no, it says it a little differently here. Let me read it in another version, which I believe is, is, is really giving the true meaning. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. I have a friend by the name of Charles Peter. One of the things he always uh, said to me was that he believes he's going to be martyred one day. He kind of looked forward to it, right? I was never that kind of person. If I, if I have to be martyred, I guess I will take it. Jesus will take me through, but... I'm not, look, I'm not looking forward to be stoned or to be executed or anything. But God is telling us as his people, God is saying, look here. Some of you, when this time comes, we are looking forward to the end. We, we, we are seeing that we are in the last days. Listen, God says, my people, some of you are going into captivity. You will go. Some of you are going to be killed with a sword. You will be killed. This calls for patience and faithfulness on the part of God's people. You remember when we were going through chapter six and we saw the souls under the altar and they said, how long, O oh Lord, before you avenge our blood? And they were given white robes and they were told that they were to rest for a little season until their fellow brethren should be killed as they were. It does not seem reasonable to me that in the civilized 21st century, they are going to kill people for the way you worship. Not in the Western world. I could see in a crazy place like North Korea or maybe China. But I, I can't see how that is possible in a civilized place like the United States and England and Canada and Jamaica. And I don't see it. But the word of God says that this is what will happen to us. And God is saying to us, we should be prepared for it. That's what God is trying to do, to prepare us for it. That's an interesting point, right, David? You know that brother, brother Arthur and myself had a discussion, uh, like two days ago, 
And and he was saying that, and I was saying, no, no, brother Arthur, that wouldn't make sense because it says that he that leadeth into captivity shall go, and he that killeth the sword. And he was saying it's the it's the it's the saints, and I say, well, the saints never lead anybody into captivity or ever kill with the sword. And I guess he probably said, okay, I see what you're saying. But I mean, the point he was making was really that, and possibly that he had used another translation to look at it. But it it, it does make sense what you say based on what it says in the other translation. Yes, and the last part of the verse, you know, where it calls for yeah. patience and endurance. I mean, yeah. yeah, 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 makes sense. Brother David. Yes, Sister Diane. Why is it so um, far-fetched that it would happen in the Western world? The so-called Europe called themselves civilized and they did it. I mean, this type of punishment for God's people is, is not new. It wouldn't be new in the last days. Brother David. Yes, Brother Maurice. Uh, a little over almost 15 years ago, I was trying to tell people about uh, guillotines being stored over in uh, near Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've, I've gathered information that says I'm within walking distance of a store of those same guillotines in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm within a day's walk of those guillotines, uh, an hour's drive. And so I'm not so sure it wouldn't happen in America. You know, the thing is, I was born, and most of us were born under the illusion of civil civilization. Under, under, I, I've never seen a world war. I've never seen a war. I mean, I live in Jamaica, and even those of you who live in America, I mean, unless you have been in the army and you went out to attack Vietnam or something, you have never seen war. We, grew, we, we have grown up in a generation where we think this is a norm. This is a normal way of life, but it's it's it, it, we are being reminded, even by what you brethren are saying, we are being reminded that this is not the pattern of the human race. What we are looking at is an anomaly. We are looking at a period of time in the history of the world when Paul says they will say peace and safety just before sudden destruction comes. So we are looking at the human race be uh, behaving in a non-typical way. And the thing is that we have persuaded ourselves. I've, I persuaded myself. My psyche comes to accept that this is normal. But God is reminding us this is not normal. The normal way of carnal humanity is bloodshed and brutality and intolerance. So while it's hard to understand, I believe what the word of God says. And I remember that it was just a little before I was born that in the civilized world, the Second World War took place where, where people killed 60, was it 60 million? 60 million human beings blew themselves to bits. I remember where America dropped an atomic bomb on, on Hiroshima where they say, I think they say 600,000 perish in the first 10 seconds or something like that. Human beings, civilized humanity. So when I stop to think of these things, my, my, my idealism flees from my head and I realize the Bible is true. God is, God is saying mankind is going to go back to its natural condition and the enemy is going to be those who dwell in heaven. So God says, God says, you know, every, all of this is for us to prepare us. And God says, my people, here is the call for patience and, and endurance on the part of God's people. Now it says in verse eight, and we're probably going to stop at verse eight because we've already been going too long. Verse eight and nine, okay? And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. As we said, as brother Ayayi pointed out, dwell upon the earth as opposed to those that dwell in heaven. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Um, again, I have to make this point. I have to, to divert a little bit because there is a false idea associated with this, this particular verse. And I want to always make sure that I clear up that idea. I'm going to Revelation 17 to compare it to Revelation 17, verse 8. Because in many ways, these two chapters overlap. Because Revelation 17 is talking about the beast. And Revelation 13 is talking about the beast. So you have a lot of overlapping. Now it says that everybody who dwells on the earth shall worship the beast. We saw what this means. It means they will submit to the beast, to the authority of the beast, above God's authority. 
let me put in a little plug here. I don't love to dwell on this thing. People might say I'm obsessed, but there's only one issue that I know of where the entire planet is coming together to, to require something of every human being right now that the, the word of God declares to be an abomination. It's only one thing I know. The world permits many things, but they don't mandate and try to force people to do things contrary to the mind of God, except on this one matter. Anyway, I'm just I'm, I'm not going to this next week. I'm going to talk about that more, but not this evening. I just touch on that. But listen to what it says. They worship the beast. They submit to the beast. In opposition to submitting to God. And who are those who do it? They are those whose names are not written in the book of life. Now, the last part of the verse says. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I am going to say to you that this is a mistranslation. I'm going to say it clearly and without apology. First of all, I'm going to show you the same verse in the New American Standard Bible. Then I'm going to show you a comparison with Revelation 17. If you look at the same verse in the NASB, look at what it says. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. The verse does not say that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. The verse does not say this. Okay, okay. What, what the verse says is that the names were written from the foundation of the world. Now, somebody might ask, why would you take the NASB over the King James Version? How do you know the King James Version is not correct? I'm going to go to the King, King James Version, but this time I'm going to go to the to chapter 17 of Revelation. Chapter well, 17. I said, yeah. before we move along, I just want to let you know that. One, one one second. Second. Let me finish my sentence, Ian. Let me just finish the sentence. In Revelation 17 on the right panel, Revelation 13 on the left panel, we're going to look at a parallel passage in Revelation 17. Go ahead now, Ian. You are saying that the ESV says it the same way as the right. NA, NA. And I believe most versions say it like the NASB, not like the King James. All right. But the King James, no. The King James, we are comparing Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. Here's what the King James says in chapter 17. Let me go to chapter 17, King James Version. Coincidentally, it's the same verse 8. It says, they that dwell on the earth shall wander whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world same king james version in, in chapter 17 it shows you that the the foundation of the world has reference to when the names were written not to when the lamb was slain and why am i making this point it's because i believe that jesus was slain at Calvary, not the foundation of the world. And of course, you, you somebody will say, well, that's true, but the benefits of his death were being experienced from the foundation of the world. I can partially agree with you, but most of the people who say this, you know what they will say? They will say that when Jesus came, nothing changed. They say from the foundation of the world, Every benefit that Christ came to give was already available because he was slain in God's mind. He was slain from the foundation of the world. So that's true. It's like Pentecost didn't mean anything. It's like, it's like when Jesus came, no great change took place in the in, in the life and in the in the experience of God's people. I believe the Bible teaches nobody was born again before Jesus died, before Jesus was slain. You had people who were converted, people who committed themselves to God, but nobody received a new birth because it did not exist until Jesus came and produced that new life. That's, That's true. A lot, of, a lot of people um, use that verse as an anger for those nonsense that they, they teach. So that uh, same verse. Question here. Yes, just before, you, before you win, Nikki and then win. Yes. Um. Does the verse mean that literally everybody who because God knows the end, right? Like, he knows what's going to happen. Is it saying that 
from the beginning of the world, from the foundation of the world, God had already written the names of the people in the book who will end up accepting his gift. Is that what they say? I think so. I don't see that. I don't see any other way that I could interpret it. Okay. So, uh, but it's not predestination, right? Because it's still their no, choice. No, 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 it's for knowledge. It's just that God knows. My name was in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Praise God. But it was because God kind of knew, knew that, that my, my perverse course would be turned around. So he just wrote it there. All right. I, I, that's the way I have to understand it. Okay. Um, Brother Wayne, go ahead. Uh, that was basically my question. Thanks. All right. Um, so, so. The, the last verse we look at is verse 9, where it says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Everybody has an ear. Everybody has ears. Everybody has, has an auditory canal, and they have an eardrum, and they, they, the sound vibrates against your eardrum, and they, they, the nerves take it, and it, the signal is translated, and you hear sounds, and you, you get images. This is not what Jesus meant or what revelation means. Everybody has an ear. Not everybody has a spiritual ear. In, in, when I was a boy, my mother would always say to me, why are your ears so hard? And my ear was just as soft as anybody else's ear, okay? But what she meant was, why won't you take heed to what I'm saying to you? To, to, for me to not have an, a hard ear would simply be that I begin to submit and I do what my mother wants me to do. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's what the Bible is saying. If any man have an ear, you, if, you, if, if you have any sense, if you have a heart that is capable of understanding, hear, listen, hear what God is saying, take heed to it, and respond appropriately. So that's what he's saying, all right? So we have struggled and gotten to the end of, of, of and we have gotten to the end of, I, I hear you, Brother Wayne, we have gotten to the end of, and Brother Frederick, Wayne and Frederick, I hear you. We have struggled and we have gotten to the end of verse 10. So we have, we have completed our examination of the first beast. So next week, we are going to hopefully take a short time, examine the second beast, and then we'll get to the mark of the beast. All right? So yes, go ahead, Brother Wayne, and then Brother Frederick. Uh, I just want to go back to chapter verse 8. Because I'm just saying, thinking that what does it then mean when, when, it's, when in, in Genesis 3, um, when it said that... Um, that's verse 15, you know, uh, um, it, what, was Christ already offered himself from there then. We, we, we knew that Christ was to come to, to, to bring about salvation for man. I'm just thinking, isn't it more reasonable to believe that way than to believe that God wrote in a book already, those who will be saved and those who will be lost, so to speak? It just seemed to me it would be more reasonable to believe that Christ had, offer, had already been offered up from the foundation to be, to take man's place. And then came a time when he fulfilled that promise. Than to believe that God, because I think there's somewhere in Romans that talks about as if, as, uh, to give us such a suggestion as if individuals were predestinated to be saved or to be lost. And, and we have argued that point to say, we don't believe God works that way. And it sounds like it, 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 it will go contrary to this verse that we are now, yeah, that Please. has been highlighted. Um, can I ask Brother Wayne a question? Um, yeah, but let me let me respond first, and then I rem I'm remembering that Brother Frederick wants to say something, okay? But he here here's the thing. First of all, the first thing that we look at is the context of the verse, okay? Revelation 17 is King James version, and so is so is chapter 13, and chapter 17 gives you a clear statement. And then when you look at other versions of the Bible that that co co correspond and corroborate, then the evidence from the text seems to be um seems to be very strong that's point number one the second point is that um when i was a, a teenager i got confused about this issue of predestination versus foreknowledge god knows everything god knows everything um you remember what jesus said to the, the, the disciples when they came back and they said lord even the devils are subject to us in your name and he says don't rejoice in this rejoice that your names are written in the book of life and this was this was this was before the, the 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 comforter came. This was before life came to them. So I, I do believe that God knows what will happen. And if God if God 
has a book in which he records the future. It, as a matter of fact, we are dealing with revelation. Maybe it's not even a literal book. Maybe it's in the mind of God. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, it, saying it that way as a fact, but I'm saying that in the book of Revelation, it's not always as superficial as we, we think it is. What it means is that God knows those who belong to him. Paul says as much, right? Jesus says, all that my father has given me shall come to me and nobody is able to pluck them out of my hand. In some ways, the Bible seems to promote this idea that God foreknows and is working to save those that he, knew, he knows. So, so I would look at it that way. Go Judas, ahead, uh, Judas is the son of perdition. Right, but let brother, I, I don't want to, to spoil protocol. So brother Frederick and then Nikki. Yes, good evening, everyone. You know, I pray always that God would give us um, the same understanding on the prophecies. Every day it's my prayer, every morning, that this group will have the, um, a common understanding on the prophecies and united. Um, and, you know, you know, <clears throat> I interrupt sometimes, but I try this time not to interrupt, but to see how best I can <laughs> appreciate the, the, the point of views that you, you, you put across. But what I find difficult, though, very difficult to grasp. Um, most of us, or many of us would know, um, so the, the, the ideas that I um, um, share from time to time. But what is very difficult for me to grasp is that the, the, the heads, though the heads of Daniel 7 are represented on the beast, and we accept that they are represented on the beast of Daniel 13, mm -hmm. um, Revelation 13, I'm sorry, um, I find it difficult that the horns are not represented there as well, the ten horns. Um, to say that they, I mean, from the ideas that you shared, that the ten horns of Revelation 13 are somehow, diff is a different group of ten horns from the horns on Daniel, uh, in, the, in Daniel 7. Um, but I believe that the crowning of the ten horns is actually the beginning of the reign of the seventh head, which is the last head. And um, as, as Daniel puts it forward, the, 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 the horn that came up after the ten horns rule, ruled that very same head. And after it ruled, then the, the head gets a, um, receives a deadly wound. I, I think it is a deadly wound because there is no other head to follow. I mean, and the idea that the, 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 the beast is headless. I mean, a headless beast for me, brother, is... Is, is a non-existent beast. I don't see how a beast should um, or could reign without, an, without a head. If when it got, got a, a, a wound to its head, it was almost dead. I mean, these are some of the, the points I'm having um, difficulty grasping. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I won't attempt to, um, to relate to the questions at the point because it's so late and it will take maybe a lot of time to begin to explore some of those. But when we come to Revelation 17, those are the those are the critical issues that I believe we're going to focus on. So I don't know I, 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 we, uh, if we can if we can wait until we get there to really um, delve a little more deeply into those points. I think it probably might be the better thing. Um, in actual fact, when you look at the beast, it has seven heads. There's never a point when John sees the beast when it has no head. But he's told of a time when it has no head. And um, so, so it's not like he's looking at a strange-looking headless beast because it has seven heads. But based on the explanation of the prophecy, there's a time when the heads fall because even the five that he sees first, he sees five that don't exist anymore. And he sees one that, has, that does not yet exist. So, so clearly, I mean, you can't apply normal logic to this beast because a part of this beast doesn't exist and a part of this beast has not even yet come so i understand that when um when it says that the beast has no head we could put it another way and says he has 10 minor heads but the bible doesn't represent it as head it represents it as horns and we know that a horn represents a kingdom a minor kingdom so you could you could you could interpret it put our own spin on it and say instead of one major head the beast has 10 small heads so, you know, it really depends on how you look at it. But anyway, um, yeah, Sister Diane, and then we'll, we'll come, we, we, when we get to Revelation 17, we, we will maybe look more closely at those points. But thank you, uh, Brother Frederick. Sister Diane, go ahead. 
I'm not understanding how the book of life from the foundation of the world could mean anything. Uh, I mean, I thought your name got put in the book when you professed, at least professed Christ. And so at the beginning, and I'm not born, I'm projected in a book that I haven't professed him just because he foresee me professing him. Let me show you, let me show you something that um, I've heard as one suggestion, okay? Um, let me see if I can find the verse. Um, all right, I can't find the exact words, but everybody will know the verse, all right? The idea is that at the beginning, everybody's name is in the book of life and names are blotted from the book. Now that names are added to the book. I don't see, I don't see, I've never seen a verse and I don't know if you can remind me. I've never seen a, a verse that says names are written in the book of life, but I see where it says names are blotted from the book of life. So does that make sense? Right, right. Well, you quoted one earlier, but, you, you're the disciples, but, saying that the disciples' names are written in the book of life. Yeah, but, but it doesn't say they were written at that moment. It might have been written there from the foundation of the world. But, there, but there, are, there are strong statements in the Bible, several places that say, be careful that your name is not blotted from the book of life. So it's more like a question of, will your name be removed rather than will your name be written there? Because I, I've heard the suggestion and it makes sense to me that all names are in the book of life from the beginning because Jesus Christ has provided life for everybody. And that was a part of what? But it does a, say that we were chosen from the foundations of the world. We were chosen. There's That's that too, brother. right. There's that too. There's that too. What about the text that says that God was in Christ reconciling um, the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them? Does that include everybody? That includes that... everybody. That includes everybody. So, so it seems to me. I mean, it seems it seems to me that the emphasis in the Bible is more: be careful that your name is not blotted from the book of life, because Jesus has as as provided he has given he has given everybody a place in that book of life but many names are going to be blotted from it that's what it seems to me so because of his death because he died to save the world that death provided for everybody absolutely brother david just to just to um um stir the water a little the the concept about the shut door concept all those that reconcile with this Brother, brother Chris, you're taking me into, into waters that I'm not qualified to deal with. All right, um, the shut door concept is something that is peculiarly um, related to the history of Adventism. And um, to answer you, I would have to go back and revise it. I, I mean, I, won't, I can't answer something without- I understand, without... I understand. I understand. <laughs> All right. It, it's... Brother David, in Psalm 14, it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But in the original text, it says, the fool says in his heart, no God for me. So there's a vast difference in how the King James says it and the original text. I have a copy of the actual original text, and that's what I studied by. Um, because there's the there's a lot loss in the interpretation of the scriptures and i'm sure that you you see that too yes and that, that's an interesting translation and i like that because um that's probably more accurate because a lot of people do not say there is no god they simply say i don't care that there's a god you know so i i will live my life regardless i'm not going to submit to god and yeah, that, 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 that makes sense. Anyway. Zero mentality. Who is God that I should serve him? Exactly. Anyway, I, I want to appreciate. I don't want to hold us. Oh, it's been two hours and um, that is a long. And I want, I should finish the recording here. Before you, before you finish recording, oh, that, David, that, um, that, verse screen, point David. That, that verse on the screen makes sense. Just, I think you found it to read it, but you never did. <laughs> All right. And then I'll allow Cliff to have the last word, right? It's yeah. Revelation 3 and verse 5. Um, it says, 
he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So maybe this is the, 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 the verse in particular that I had in mind. Because here it says, the danger is that your name might be blotted out of the book of life. But um, you know, apparently... one brother, it, it so says that all that the Father has given me, I shall not lose one. So there, there is an election. There, not everyone is chosen of God. The Father is the one, and Christ said He's not going to lose one of His children. So not all are children of God. It's it's very clear. Yes. Um. I agree, and I know this can become a very involved discussion that I am not willing that we should undertake after two hours. So we maybe could look at, at election and, and predestination and all the rest of it later another day. But I appreciate that because the Bible does say all of those things. It's how we put it together that probably is most critical. But go ahead, Brother Cliff, and you, you'll have the last word. After we dismiss, then if we want to talk, we can. And it's a perfect last word. Um, just a reminder to all, everyone that's living in the United States next week, everything will be one hour earlier. So we change time in the United States tomorrow, but so next week, everything will be one hour earlier. Okay, folks. Um, we don't change at all, so if you can find it, uh, if you can. We'll, be on, we'll be on the same time next week. Yeah. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. That's a good reminder. All right, brother, brother Howard, can you can you just offer the closing prayer for me, please? Sure, no problem. Father, we just want to give you thanks and praise for the awesomeness of of your promise that when your spirit is come, he will guide us into all truth, and and we can we can see the evidence of that even this evening as we are just looking at the same verses that we have looked over for years and years. We're seeing more light coming forth from it, and we just thank you for this. We just ask that as we have gleaned and, and garnered from what you brought to our minds, that we will seek to implement them in our lives, that indeed we will be the witness and the testimony to others that you are a God and you are willing and wanting to expand your family to include everybody on this earth. Be with us all as we go through this coming week. We just ask your continual guidance and protection, especially for those living in the U.S. as they enter into this um, troubled week of elections and the, the implication and repercussions. I just pray your guidance over us all. And may we stay under the shadow of your wings. So pray we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.